This is the story of a man and a woman who lived in a beautiful garden. It's a story of a snake who tricked mankind for thousands of years. It's a story of God and his promises. It's the story of one who's coming back to crush the head of the snake. And to give us that home we once had, we might have forgotten. do this. Let me just, let me pray us again. I know we've prayed. I want to pray into this for a moment. Would you do that? Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you speak to every heart. Help us to capture your vision for our lives and for our, our communities, for our homes, for our schools, for our city, as we seek to live out this better story that you've given to us in Jesus. So speak through me, Lord, I pray. In your name, amen. Hey, so I don't know if you've thought about this much. So this Wednesday, we will pause and remember, I hope, the most infamous hijacking that's ever taken place in history. You know, hijacking makes for some great filmmaking, dramatic filmmaking, but in real life, it's not something you want to be a part of. 19 terrorists hijacked four... Uh, Domestic airlines, you know this, over American airspace that resulted in the death of 3,000, almost 3,000 innocent Americans. And for those of us who are old enough to remember this, and how about this, Gen Z is marked by the fact that most of them don't, many of them don't remember this and will not, but an event that marked our lives and forever changed the course of our nation. We've never quite been the same. Since then, you're reminded of that every time you fly, right? There's a time when you didn't have to walk through those big lines of security and such. But again, that that's, makes for dramatic, you know, filmmaking or storytelling. But in real life, not something you want to experience. And yet, the Bible tells us that that's precisely the story we find ourselves in. That God's story has been hijacked. And it's been an inside job. It's been our sin. You know the biblical story, right? Creation, the fall, quickly. I guess there's Eden for a moment. There's the fall. And then there's redemption to come in Christ. Then for us, there's discipleship, if you will, receiving His grace. And then growing, sanctification, we call it. To live out this new vision of humanity that Christ has given to us really called the kingdom of God, to live a different kind of life. And then ultimately there's heaven, a new heaven, a new earth. And yet we find ourselves often, don't, aren't you like me? Don't you feel like the story you're trying to live out um, has been hijacked? It's as if there, we're on a divergent path. We're off the grid. And, and, and sometimes this happens, I know, often in our personal lives. Those of us who are pursuing Jesus, we become kind of like Paul who said, um, who said I, tr I find myself doing things I don't want to do. And yet we keep fighting the good fight. But, but a lot of us are sensing that now there's signs everywhere, even in America. It seems that we're off the grid. The feedback loop tells us that we've lost our handle. Even the American system seems to be failing in certain ways, right? Uh, there, there, there's, there's this new anger. There's this emotional exhaustion. Talked to one of our members just the other night who said, I can't even listen to the news anymore. And I said, don't. Right? Fill your mind with the Word of God. Maybe you need to get, uh, get away from that. And, and, and we're so challenged by that. There's the breakdown of the family. There's this undercurrent of anxiety we've talked about, this generalized anxiety. Mental health issues seem to be a pandemic. And those are real, real things. And we're here as a church to help in every way. But a lot of this, I'm, I'm going to contend today, that the secular story is not working. And when I say secular, I'm talking about what it means. Earthly, worldly, non-spiritual. It's what the writer of Ecclesiastes called uh, life under the sun, life without God. How's that working out for us? 
And yet we continue. We are. We're moving further, further away. And everybody knows the secular story is not working. And I'm going I'm to contend that's good news. That's really good news. And the more crazy it makes us, the more I, it causes me to think, well, listen, we've got to get back to this new vision of humanity that is the kingdom of God. We need to recognize, understand the story we find ourselves in and live it out. That's what the Christian life's all about. So it inevitably points us to God's better story for the world. And that is really good news because we have good news. We have light to bring into the lives of others around us. So, so what I want to do for just a moment, this is admittedly, it's a little different kind of sermon, um, because today we, we got to share in the Lord's Supper. We have another ordinance, the two ordinances of the church we're going to celebrate with baptism afterwards. And uh, we get to, with great joy, celebrate these two ordinances that both help us identify with Jesus. Watch this. His death, right, and resurrection. Our death, this is not, watch this. The Christian life is not simply identifying. It's not just, that's a part of the Christian life. It is all about the Christian life. It's why, why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who now lives in me. And so we get to do this. So spoiler alert, both of those, the ordinances, point us to the answer of the challenges we face in this world. But here's what I want to do. I want to compare, really contrast, the, um, the secular narrative up against the biblical narrative. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, anxiety, kind of the cure for the common worry and anxiety, generalized anxiety, which is uh, the explosive power of a new affection. It's Jesus himself. It's not being distracted by a million things, but being focused on one thing. And we all know, particularly those of us who are believers, and I think a lot of people are sensing it. We need some kind of revival. We need a personal renewal in our lives. We need spiritual renewal. We need a revitalization of the church in America. We, we need to be the light that he's called us to be. Now, again, to be clear, the, the God's story, his better story is creation. He created us. We have sinned against him. We, we fell, a big part of the story. Then he comes to redeem us in Jesus we receive his grace, and, and, and then ultimately heaven. All of this is kind of summed up in a verse that we learned this summer, if you're with us, through the Romans road trip. It's Romans 6.23. It's up on the screen. Let's say this together. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So look at this. No longer do I live out my own personal vision for life. This is a challenge every day. For me, I want to live his vision for my life in a resurrected power that he now has given me. I can overcome sin. I like what he says in Romans 6. Look at what it says on the screen there. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we certainly also will be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now we read that and we go, yeah, the resurrection, heaven. No, no, no. He's talking about now. Watch this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who died has been set free from sin. It's as if he's saying, hey, a dead man, a dead woman can't sin. They don't have a will of their own. He says, those of us who received Christ, we now live out this redemptive story. Under his power, we live a different kind of life for the world to see. Now, here's what I want you to put on your thinking caps with me for a moment. Because uh, in his book, The Redemptive Self, Dan McAdams opens with an observation uh, that he saw very much involved in kind of this response directly after 9-11. And what he saw uh, is what he called a distinctive, distinctively American response. For those of y'all who remember... There was immediately this kind, in the midst of grief, confusion, uh, bewilderment, what in the world has happened, there was this immediate response of optimism. You might even remember the president, ground zero, with his megaphone. And the whole sense of all of it, we're going to rebuild. We're going to be better than we were. This, this city is going to rise up. This nation is going to be better than it was. In a word, McAdams said it was 
Redemption was the storyline. And he said that was, that's a distinctively American thing. And, and, and I, I thought about that a lot. He goes on to unpack a little bit. That now we have this, this Christian framework of, you might call, revival or, or the, the biblical story. But now it, it is what uh, Mark Sayers, author, pastor, calls, we're seeking progress without presence. Progress without the presence of God in the secular story. So, again, hang with me here. As we, we think about seeking renewal and cultural revival, and, and most people are, are, experiencing, are, are desiring that. How do we make the world a better place? And most of us, it seems, now we just run to politics. If we can get our man in the White House, we get this guy voted, we can vote this gal in and do this, then finally this will come making the political structure of our nation our idol and our God. Where else would the secular mind run, right? The Christian mind can run elsewhere. It's called the kingdom of God. The secular story is not working and people are freaking out. And this is good news. Because we have the answer. What I've seen, a secular revival has been the recent tide coming in. But I'm believing the tide is going out. And it's time for us to step into that space and offer the answer. You say, well, how do we do that? Do I need to get elected into office? No, no, no. Maybe. Maybe. You start where you are. You start with people in your family. You start with people at your school, new classmates, new teachers, and we find ourselves then contrasting the secular story with God's story. Now, follow with me here. Uh, the secular story goes like this. First, okay, let's, let's do it. Uh, there's, there's creation in the biblical story. In the secular story, there's no creation. There's not a creator. It's functional atheism. We have somehow evolved time and chance has been on our side, and we are the greatest species on the planet. So consider that. You start without God. We were not here put and created in the Imago Dei, the, Im the image of God. We're not in his image. We're not given now then life for his purpose. Take that off of the table. Now let's move on. I guess you move to Eden. Right. And Eden in the secular story where, you know, unfallen, walking with God in the biblical story, Eden becomes now Eden is um, getting back to who you were before. So the fall is this. Maybe it's childhood trauma. Maybe it's father wounds. Uh, the fall is even binding commitments that stop me from my happiness. Hang on to that, because that's salvation. That's where this goes. Are you tracking with me? Salvation in the secular story is happiness, which we've defined as pleasure. We're Epicureans. And so pleasure then uh, is my pursuit. And anything that stands in the way of that is sin. Anything that obstructs my individual self. So it could be um, outside authorities. It could be externally given identities or, or, or truth that comes from the outside in because there's really no truth. And so we've said it before, really the, the mantra, the secular scheme is you do you. That's the ultimate end. You do you, and which means whatever makes you happy, do that. Again, how's that working out for us? Because the Bible teaches us that that's not what sin is at all. Sin is actually a turning away from God and his plan for our lives, right? But now what's interesting, sin has become anything, almost anything difficult now is sin. I've got to remove that from my life. Whatever doesn't bring pleasure and help me discover my autonomous self and live out my life that I want to live, that's sin. I'm trying to find my true self we got to flee from binding commitments. It's why, why we see this you know, kind of a commitment phobia from anything external. And, and so now we, we see discipleship as this pathway to happiness where I can become me, who I want to be. The Bible teaches us not, you do you, live out your life in whatever makes you happy. Instead, the Bible says, no, 
no, no, die to yourself and follow me. Because that's where you find purpose and joy in life is by pursuing Christ, right? This is the holy life. Sanctification is self-sacrificing love, becoming more like Jesus. And, 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 and that doesn't mean we've also, we've also got this wrong as a church, or church, the capital C church. Fewer opinions, a lot more love. That's what we need. We need to lead with love, right? In relationships that you're in, why don't we just love for free? That's just a lot easier. And it'll, it'll calm your heart down. It'll bring your anxiety and worry down. Why don't we just love people like Jesus has loved us? So this is really good news because it's light in a world that is desperate for it. And I love the fact that we, I, get to bring this to people all day long. And so I want to talk about how we do this. Jesus said in John 12, 46, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. We don't have to keep going this pathway. People don't have to live out this false narrative. They can join us in this story that makes, not only makes sense, but it brings joy and purpose to our lives. I want you to be thinking about people you know. And I want you to turn to Matthew 28. Would you do that? Grab your Bible. Turn to, I'm just going to look, look at two passages of Scripture. Today, on a day where we get back to the core ordinances, the two ordinances of the church, I thought it would be a good day to focus on the core of why we're here as a church. We're going to talk a lot about this next uh, month. We're going to celebrate 80 years uh, as a church family uh, next month. And we're going to talk about kind of the past, we're going to talk about the present, we're going to talk about the future. It's going to be a great celebration. We'll talk a lot about this next month. Matthew 28, immediately, 28, 18 through 20, some of you know this passage. In fact, we call this passage the what? Anybody? The Great Commission. Yes. Um, we know this because it's central to our mission as a, as a church, at the capital C Church. It's why Christ, it's, it's the great co-mission. I've said it before, co with mission. It's the with Jesus' mission. It's that one. He has a mission. He, he calls us to join him in the mission. And here's what he says. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all. Always to the end of the age. Now catch this, that last part there. This is progress with presence. You see the difference? His Holy Spirit now with us. Uh, I, I noted earlier, it's not the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. As, we're, as Baptists, we, we've gone that way. It's, it's, it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now yes, Scripture is central. That's why we're teaching it. We always do. It's our, our authority. It's where we run. But the Spirit speaks. We need more uh, of His presence in our lives. And it comes through prayer. It comes through an abiding in Him. And so there's one driving verb. I've taught on this before, but let's, let's look at this. The driving verb, if you break this down in the Greek syntax, there's a driving verb with three participial phrases, what we use you know, in, in English, I-N-G, words. This is how this breaks down. The first, the big verb that guides all this is make disciples. A disciple is an apprentice of Jesus. It's someone who's been captured by his grace and now worshiping him in every area of life. And we go to make disciples. Now, before I dive into this, we often think of this. Some of us are already doing it. I have a tendency to do this. This is an institutional thing. We're making disciples as a church. I hope our church is making disciples. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm giving faithfully. We make disciples. Hope the pastor and our leadership, all the crew is making disciples. No, no, no. This is you. Every day. It's me. Making disciples. It means we're reaching people with the gospel. It means we're raising them up. Spending time. Making disciples, essentially. You, you, you hang out with me. Follow me as I follow Jesus. I'm going to teach you how to do this. And then he says, here's, the, here's how we do that. How do you do this? Going, okay, Wherever you may go, you could say, where, as you go, some have said, but it's more intentional than that. Light has to go into dark places. So where are you, do you see dark places in your world, in your life? Might be in your family. 
We all have some sense of darkness. It might be new people that you're meeting. It may be a friend. You, you walk across the room. You walk across the street. You may go across the city or around the world. Going. Baptizing. This implies salvation. Baptism is the story of salvation. Again, identifying with Christ in his death and resurrection. Last week, I was talking to one of our students who's getting baptized today. And I was explaining to him that, you know, a lot of us miss this. We were talking about the water is, you know, totally forgives that we're totally immersed. So all of my sin is forgiven. Um, but a lot of Baptists even uh, miss this, that, that the water, it's actually a watery grave. That's really the image. I mean, these are, these are dead people going down. Dead, raised up again, just as Jesus was, with resurrected power, totally forgiven, fully loved by God, empowered by His Spirit to overcome sin in my life. This is the Christian life, right? So going, baptizing, and teaching everything He says, everything He's taught us, being in His Word, this is why it's so important. We're reading through the New Testament right now. Join us. You've got to be in his word. Because you're getting a million messages all week long. Drives you to the secular story. And that ends with all kinds of anxiety and frustration. Going, baptizing, teaching. This is our job. Okay? So here's what I want to do. I want to challenge us to be the church as we go. Uh, into the world this week. Tim Dearborn wrote a book, great book called Beyond Duty. And in it, he says this, the church of God does not have a mission in the world. The God of mission has a church in the world. We have a mission that God's given to us. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, right? This new vision for humanity. We join him. This is the better story. And we share it with others as we live our lives out. Now, I want to I close by looking at another verse. It's Acts 1.8. If you've been around here much, you know this is a central verse in, in our church family as well. Here's a kind of a reframing of the Great Commission. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And sure enough, Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. He now resides in everyone who's received Him. You have the Spirit of God living in your life today. If you have become a believer, a follower of Jesus. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, all of Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. Now, we read this. Again, I want to reframe this. Think with me. We read this geographically, and that is what it was. Why did he say Jerusalem? That's where they were. So there's concentric circles moving out from Jerusalem, right? But I want you to think of it this way with me to apply it to our own lives. Uh, I want you to think of it as being kind of gospel-centered and moving away from what we could call a biblical worldview, less scripture, let more toward the secular story. Okay? And by the way, this is happening, don't you know it, generationally. You can almost play out millennials, Gen Z. I mean, it continues. The research is showing us. That's where this is going. The bell, whether the marks are there, and, and, and we see where this is heading. And, and, and yet, again... Light shines in the darkness. We have an opportunity. So here, break it down with me like this. Okay, first we're in Jerusalem, all right? This is homogeneous. It's, it's familiar. It's safe. It's Christian. It's, it's biblical, okay? We like Jerusalem, don't we? I love Jerusalem. If we could just stay in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is what you're feeling right now. And it's when you come to church. It's probably in part why we do come to church. These are my people, right? Yes, we all agree we love each other. We almost agree. We love each other a lot. We do. We all, I mean, really, we love God. It's why we're here. And we, we praise Him. I love seeing you. Let's talk about the Bible. You know, you don't get a lot. The Bible? What? You know, you don't get a lot of that. You, you come here and you go, man, I love Jerusalem. I want to stay in Jerusalem. And Jesus, Jesus says, I don't want you to stay in Jerusalem. I want you to go to Judea. Let's go. Judea is what I'm going to call Christian-ish, okay? It's diverse. It's, it's different. It's unfamiliar in many ways. And I think, I want you to think, again, think about your world, your circles of influence. This could be people in your own family. There's a haunting kind of Christian, you know, framework, but they're not really believers. They don't follow Jesus. They might even could tell you all about Jesus. 
in the Bible to some degree. We see this uh, across Dallas. Uh, we call it cultural Christianity, right? Um, I was on an airplane last week, found myself sitting between two Mormons, brothers, who had eight other siblings, but that's beside the point. There's two of them, and I, so I'm one of the last guys getting on the plane. I don't know if they designed this, like planned this. So I said, I know God did. So I, I sat down between these two guys, and I'm going to study for a couple hours. I mean, getting ready for a sermon, right? I'm going to study a little bit, and so I'm working away, and then enter into conversation, one guy in particular on the left. And so I put my computer down, let's go. <laughs> and so for an hour and a half, I talked to this guy, talked to his brother, talking to both of them, um, with love, for real. Like, I mean, I'm loving these guys. The Lord's given me a love for all people. And I'm seeking to love these guys for I want to listen. Here, tell me more about this. He didn't know that, you know, I mean, I have a doctorate in apologetics, and I kind of know a little bit about Mormonism, but I'm just listening to him. And, um, but the, even the point there, it's not really, not so much to win an argument. It's to love him first, right? And so we talked, and I talked about the explicit gospel and the scriptures that teach us that you bring nothing to your salvation but your sin that makes it necessary. So there's not Jesus plus. And I was saying, the, there's not the Bible plus. There's not Doctrines and Covenants, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price. And, 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 and we agreed to disagree in the end that he's saying, and he said it explicitly, it's Jesus plus good works or you don't make it. And I said, there, there's nothing we can add to it. Praise be to God. I want you to be set free from this bondage that you're living in. Because he was saying, you can even lose your salvation. I mean, maybe, and, and I started to think, you know, some of, some of us might believe some of that stuff. I mean, we want to throw rocks at the Mormons or whoever else. But many of us need to get our minds around the biblical story and understand God's word. Because you see, in Judea, it can be challenging because we step into these conversations with preconceived ideas about God and Jesus and the word of God. And, some, and often it's very negative perceptions, right? We've got to change that by the way that we love people. We need to go into Judea, and we need to love people by sharing the gospel, our friends, our family. Then we go to Samaria. Now, Samaria is heterogeneous. It's, it's divergent. It's assorted. It's conflicting. And we see this generationally, gang. We're watching this. The, a recent study came out on the, the Gen Zers, and, and two out of five, nearly 40%, are no, no religious affiliation, not growing up in, in a church, not, their family's not, or atheist. 40%. This is, this is three times greater than all the other generations before them. That's where this is going. And, and I say this because now we don't have to go across the world to say, let's bring a, a gospel message to people. We, we, we live outside of Jerusalem now. And to take an Old, old Testament uh, picture or, or analogy, we, we find ourselves in exile as believers. Now, we get to the New Testament. We're no longer in exile. We're ambassadors. But look at where it goes. We go to the ends of the earth. This is where it's converse. That is reversed. It's opposing. It's threatening. Because this is where the gospel's not been heard. And there's a reason it hasn't been heard. There's opposition. This is where it gets dangerous. And Jesus says, I want you to go there too. For you, it might be talk, looking and talking to people who don't look like you. It may be as simple as people who, how about people who don't like you? And just loving them for free. Friends, listen, there is no plan B. There's no plan B. This is it. Our story's been hijacked. But we get to tell the world that it has been. And that we have the answer. And it's in Christ alone. Because, look at this, in him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. That is the gospel story. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan, a better plan, 
a better story for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is God's better story. Let's pray together as we determine to live for him this week. Friend, I want you to just, yes, we've already identified. We remember what Christ has done for us. Now I want you to just identify with his death and resurrection. How do you need to die to yourself? Death is never easy, but it leads to life. You can't have resurrection apart from death. How do you need to die to yourself today? And throughout this message, whom has God placed on your heart? That you just need to love into the kingdom. Love and share the good news with them. Lord, we love you. And we praise you for Jesus. Our hope is found in you. And we now celebrate with our brothers and sisters whose lives have been transformed by the gospel. We give you our lives anew. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.